Before we get started, the million dollar question I get every day, email after email, what is it like to live with this disorder? I've been living with it for 32 years, and this is what it's like. Get a bottle of wine, drink it really, really fast, put on two boxing gloves, put on a pair of goggles and put a zipper on your mouth. Now you're entering my world. That's how complex it is. Things change from second to second. Everything with the condition has to be memorized. Nothing comes natural to me. I have to be taught everything step by step. And I'll get into some of the ranges, some of the different details of the disorder, and I'm ready to go when we can start doing the slides. Cool. Dyspraxia is a neurological disorder throughout the brain that results in lifelong impaired motor, memory, judgment, processing, and other cognitive skills. Dyspraxia also impacts the immune and central nervous systems. Each dyspraxic person has different abilities and weaknesses, as dyspraxia often comes with a variety of comorbidities. Nobody has dyspraxia alone. If I don't know what comes first, second, or third in my day, good luck writing an intro, a middle, or a conclusion. If I don't see in three dimensions, because it's underdeveloped my sense of the world around me, now let's try geometry. So it molds into other conditions, which I'll break into a little bit further as we go along. Ah, that's me. Even more confused. You can't see my hidden disorder. That's one of the biggest problems I face with this, this condition. I live in a big city, Chicago. And even taking the bus, I have to sit or give a lecture to the bus driver and to all the passengers that I need a seat. If I don't see in three dimension and the, the bus is going 50 miles an hour and I have no sense of space, the person with the wheelchair, they got the seat. The older lady, everyone stands up. And then I try to get my balance and I run into someone and who do you think gets yelled at? Me. <laughs> Growing up, my parents had no name for what made my world different. And some of the common struggles that dyspraxic kids face. When I was 19 years old, I, by chance, I went to the UK. And when I went there to study, I just went there to study abroad, have the experience. And when I got there, they looked at my documentation and they go, you have dyspraxia, don't you? I go, what does that mean? I never heard this word before. And then they go, well, you could take a train and every county has a support group. There are people like me? Like, oh yeah, 10% of the population has it. And if you're an adult, the government takes care of it. Your housing, your food, and your transportation. So at that point, my world opened up so I can learn from those experts, which I stayed for six years, I kept extending my visa, in order to bring over this information in this country to provide education for parents and adults alike. With this, their support, dyspraxia has started, as I said, we're the only foundation that covers the full range of DCD, developmental, and global dyspraxia. You'll be looking at a complete and utter range with this condition. Some kids who are globally impacted with dyspraxia, you would struggle to hear and understand what they're saying motorically. My verbal IQ is a 135. My visual IQ is a 68. I live my life in the utmost peril that you can imagine. So that's what we're saying, we're fighting for the true complexities and I'll get into the more details of the disorder as we go along. Here we go. Developmental coordination disorder is a lifelong neurological motor planning based disorder that affects fine and gross motor development. My dad has this. My dad is the stereotypical attorney who writes like a two year old. He's not doing it on purpose, neither are your local doctors. There's a motor planning situation where they have to think about creating a motor plan. I have to think about everything. Everything I do has to be converted from short term into long term memory. Most, mo the neurological disorder throughout the brain results in DCC, memory, judgment, processing, other cognitive skills, the immune and central system and also the speech delays that we talked about, the globally impacted child or adult. If you don't have dyspraxia by now, sorry, it's too late. Dyspraxia <laughs> is present from birth. I was born this way. You can also have the condition which is called apraxia via result of a head injury, a stroke, lesion, or damage. It's not a speech disorder. It's, there's a lot of confusion with some of the terminology in this country. Chase, the amazing little boy I'm staying with, is globally impacted. He was born this way, but with therapies and support through the, the underdevelopment, his speech will develop. My nan used to be a, a seamstress in Broadway. She had a stroke, she couldn't tie her shoes. She had another stroke, she couldn't speak correctly. I don't care how much therapy she would have had, I don't think she would have developed to the stages I am now presenting to you guys. 
one in 10 have this disorder to one degree or another, whether from DCD to developmental to global. It's a complete other range, like I was saying. It is thought to be the result of neurons not connecting, sinking, and firing upon its proper means. So what happens is my brain should have these neurons that connect and fire and sink like everybody else's. That's the problem. It's stopping. It's not connecting. It's not reaching the point. And that because of that, everything I do, like I said, has to be that memorization of what I could store, how I could function, and how I can process. Unfortunately, I can only do one thing at a time, which takes roughly 30 seconds to convert each piece of information over from short-term into long-term memory. Because of that, I'm wrongly labeled as having ADHD. <laughs> what in fact, I am paying attention. It's my focus, because I can only focus on one step. Unfortunately, in an academic setting, I'm on problem two, the kids are on problem six, my anxiety goes through the roof. Why are they progressing so much further than me? It's because they don't have to do those things like I do, every little step. The genetic component is absolutely amazing. You have over 60% of dads, according to research in the UK, who have this condition, who pass it on to their child. The other large component, as you can imagine, is premature births because their neurons didn't develop. They came out a little bit too early. So those are the huge components of the genetics and the predisposition to have this disorder. And there's still much research that is needed. The best research is in the UK for this condition. They had a transition where it went from, it's only children, to wait a minute. If I can't write within the lines, it's probably not a good idea for me to take a 2,000 pound automobile and get within the lines. So it, it progresses to different stages of development. But what happened was, because of that, the UK would say it's just a clumsy child and it goes away. Those people like you know Harry Potter, you probably heard of, or Florence Welch, they were told as kids that once you become an adult, it's gone. Well, because of the obsession to convert information over, everything we do is obsessive, which can turn into addictions. So someone like Daniel Radcliffe is a full-blown alcoholic because of this, because of his judgments, because of wanting to master how to drink, to be good, thinking that would make it more impactful in a social situation. There are no physical signs that a newborn baby has dyspraxia or DCD. Well, my mom knew to an extent something was going on because I didn't sleep for the first five years of my life. And, and I was the most fretful baby in the history of New York City, apparently, as well. And all I did was scream. It was part sensory, but it's also, I was so anxious, even as a, a little child. I remember being two or three and freaking out, because with the condition, you need the control in order to process and function. So how do you get that control? You manipulate. So when I manipulate the court, the ball's back in my court, and I could function, well, that sort of makes it seem like I'm being in. You could put the words in. <laughs> this really got happy despite the photo showing. He looks like a happy baby, but deep down he was anxious, as your child was, trying to adjust to the tone around him and the world around him. And he had the floppy or low muscle tone, awkward or admitted crawling, and feeding issues, which are very common characteristics that you can look for the child having something. The problem they have is with this condition is that it looks like everything else. If everything I do is obsessive, it doesn't mean I have OCD, I need to take OCD medication. It does not work that way. It looks like everything, but in fact it's its own neurological impairment that leads to other comorbidities. The sensory component. So sensory issues are very, very common with this, this, this condition. Vestibular dysfunction are also particularly common. Many have extreme seeking behaviors and or avoiding behaviors. With the condition, I'm a sensory seeker to the extent that I wish this place was playing loud music and it was a rave right now. That would be much more exciting than the quiet. I like that stimulation. The problem, like I'm saying, is one beer feels good, two beers feel great, ten is excellent. Well, because of my memory, judgment, processing, and functioning, I don't remember my first beer. My judgment gets worse, and you can see the cycle how it becomes more and more intense as we go along. Ah, my favorite. The concerns of mo uh, motor movement for dyspraxia are ocular. My fighting gross motor skills are excellent. What I can do with the condition is since I don't see in three dimension personally, as most of us do with developmental, I could study 2D film clips, YouTube, put that in rote memory, put that in muscle memory, and serve a tennis ball excellently. The problem is I can't study how you're going to return it. So I don't know if it's in, where to go. But since I've been hit by so many things because of my lack of space, my instincts and my reflexes are really, really good because they have to be. The eyes and the oh, there you go, you keep going. Uh, the eyes and the brain. What is actually happening is it's not working together. 
to have that sense of depth and that space around you. So even navigating this room is, in, is incredibly difficult because I don't know what's five feet or a hundred feet. You could take behavioral optometry as a therapy to give you some sort of guidance tool, but if you move something to the left or the right, it's a completely different object and world for me. That's why writing even in, in pen and paper is very difficult because I don't know about you, but a piece of paper is in 3D in my world and it's 3D in yours. But you put me on a computer, now we're talking. I can organize, I can process, I can function. It's not cheating, teachers, I swear. It's not that I'm cheating, I'm just trying to catch up with my peers. That, and it's amazing that the technology is out there. Because when I was you know, his age, and he's eight years old, in 1989, I really couldn't carry a laptop or an iPad with me. It would be very, very difficult. I would have been a genius if I had one. It just wasn't accessible. And what you'll see, like I said, with the, the DCD versus the dyspraxia is, that's actually written wrong, uh, the, D, the DCD is the fine and gross motor. So it might look like you see the handwriting, that it's immature, yes, because of the fine motor, but I can't find the lines to begin with. So if someone goes, write in the, what lines? What lines are you talking about? On a piece of computer, on a 2D, I don't have to worry about that. And plus the associated pain of hypotonia, because I can't memorize judgment. And when I play force, each object that I apply force to has different ramifications. That's why I broke everything in your house, I apologize. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was Chase, maybe it was me, maybe a little bit of both, yeah. But that's the problem. So the alternative is, okay, I'm applying too much force, then I'll write really light, and no one can see what I'm writing. There's no middle ground. <laughs> there you go. Someone didn't fall. This is Chase, her son. As you can see, he has both. Not only is his, uh, his gross motor impacted, he has no idea where he is. So he's trying to find his space, and he's trying to find where he is. So just imagine, run, forest, run. I got that. Stop, forest, stop. Mm -mm. I don't stop until I physically hit something. This is why it's probably a good idea I don't drive a car. Because I would be knowing how far an object is by running into it. Not a good idea. This is why I live in Chicago. And this is a little boy who's flying a kite for his first time. He's nine and a half years old. See, with the condition, any sort of achievements we can do are so beneficial, such as a confidence and self-esteem boost. The problem is, this is a wiring disorder. So some days are excellent, and the next day it's like the skill and task never even existed. Imagine it right now, it's a beautiful sunny day, the internet's great. Well, now I'm in Chicago, it's 40 mile an hour winds, the snow's coming out, your connection's not great. And you know as a person internally what sort of day you're going into and that you start to go down and down and everything in that day is impacted by that one negative because my long-term memory is saying, wow, I did bad that one time, everything else is going to go bad. As you can see again, some of the gross motor and a young boy playing baseball, he was just happy to be part of the team. We want to be accepted. That's all it comes down to. This is a very complex disorder, but you can't tell by looking at us all the problems that we face. So it's very difficult to form proper relationships, because I don't know about you, but how do you memorize a friendship? It's always changing and evolving. If it was like the film Groundhog Day, then I could memorize what to do and how to progress and how to do it. It doesn't work that way. You guys go too fast. And some of the fine motor difficulties with drawing, and this is uh, Noam, who has both DCD and dyspraxia. As you can see, from a six-year-old, we're happy we find anything that we could put the pen to that sort of makes sense. And look at Brian where you're wearing his socks. As you get older, this is what you do with socks, yeah? Because <laughs> several will say, okay, just put them on the right way. Well, my socks are still in three dimension. So I don't know which is the front or the back. It doesn't make any sense, so just take them off. And here's some of the fine motor difficulties who has global dyspraxia. This is an eight-year-old. If I didn't put how old this child was, you would assume the underdevelopment, you're looking at the three or four-year-old writing. Because of the underdevelopment, we're about three years behind our peer group, trying to catch up. And some of the positives of the condition, which I'll get into later, are actually looked upon negative in society, which I'll show you how that works too. And this is a, uh, oh, here we go. Some of the oral motor issues, drooling, puckering, blowing bubbles, unable to clean food off spoon with lips. See, even the food thing, this drives my wife crazy. How am I supposed to see the food on my face if I can't see my face? It's oblivious to me until I could see and understand and memorize and process it. So people be like, your food on Really? How do I see my face? This is not going to work. The poor tongue lateralization and the word pronunciation. And this is a little boy who's globally impacted. And so what the parents are doing to show the stages of development is how he's achieving year to year. And that's like a self-esteem boost, because 
I wasn't able to graduate university like other people. This is his certificate. This is his diploma of his achievement of what he's doing with his disorder. Misunderstood to be synonymous with DCD. As I said before, DCD is a fine and gross motor development disorder. Dyspraxia is an underdevelopment throughout, with which the ocular, the memory, the judgment, the processing, the function, and the senses. It's also misdiagnosed as a form of autism. If you look at Chase, a young boy, he's globally impacted, and even though he's five, he's four or five years old, he resembles a two-year-old, and since his speech is not there, you're seeing that extra component. He must be autistic. And then you speak to Chase, and you can understand bits, and then you see the empathy, the engagement into the world, how he wants to be, but how he needs to be taught how to be, because it doesn't come natural. And what part of the condition is sensory? That's a part of dyspraxia. There are many components that, like I said, make it up. And sensory for us with poor judgment is really interesting. If I see a puddle on the road, I'll run into it. What's going to happen? I get wet and I get dry. Well, I forget to take my shoes off and now I'm running through the house at age 32. My wife's freaking out. In my mind, all it is is I'm getting wet. For you guys, I'm making a mess. Things like that are, to us are very trivial because at the end of the day, no one's going to get hurt. There's a lot bigger things dealing with the condition where some of these trivial things don't you know, add up, but to you guys, they might. And it's, I said how it's mislabeled as apraxia, which that involves the head injury, the stroke, and the lesion, and the damage. And I've happened to see all three. I've got my nan, I've got my dad, and I've got me. I've seen all these ranges that I've seen in the spectrums, and it's amazing to see how my dad is just limited to motoric skills, has two degrees, and I have the education of a 10-year-old. But now he works for me. See how that works? <laughs> And it's also was used to be commonly believed as a childhood disorder. And like I said in the UK, they used to call this the clumsy child syndrome, which is highly offensive because I'm assuming I'm an adult. Once again, you have to ask my wife. She might say I'm a child still. There are some components of me that are still underdeveloped and very immature, but I've learned through experiences because I want to and I can learn. You just have to teach me and show me how to. And it's also thought that the person is being lazy. That comes with the good and bad days and the frustrations that we feel. We get so overwhelmed because what I expect in my mind and how it comes out can not only be so different, it could be offensive. But in my mind, it seems okay. For you guys, not that's so okay. And that the person is lacking intelligence. Like I said, my verbal ability with this condition and the amount I could store in my long-term memory makes me very intelligent. Quite in fact, you have to be intelligent with this condition because you're always making coping mechanisms. If you weren't intelligent to make these coping mechanisms, I don't know how you survive and cope, to be honest with you. One of the best people to seek for this diagnosis is a neuropsychologist. It's very neurological, it's very psychological, but also very situational. And that's where it becomes very difficult, because one day versus the next day, you're dealing with a completely different child in a completely different situations that come through the, through the environment that you're in. So you can't plan for how things will develop. They just do, and you sort of have to learn through experiences how to change and adapt as best as you can. AAP recommends evaluations for those with motor delays starting at nine months. You could see, like I said, a baby and some of the characteristics. The problem they have in the UK, too, is that everyone wants early intervention, but what they'll start first is global delays. It sort of mold into dyspraxia as the child starts to fail every subject in school. Instead of saying, well, this child has dyspraxia, these are some of the comorbidities that come into play. Let's set up all the therapies. Let's not limit the therapies. If you're underdeveloped, you want to take as many therapies as you can to develop. At least I would hope so. Why is the proper diagnosis important? You can't tell by looking at me everything that I'm going through. I have to self-advocate daily. I just took a plane. I had to explain to them that it's probably the bad idea to have me an emergency exit when I can't judge how much force I have through the emergency door. Because I might be ripping off that handle, and it's not a good situation if I'm trying to be helping other people on the plane. I had to explain that to United Airlines. I think they got it. <laughs> Accommodations in school. The IEP, the 504 plan, you guys are so lucky to have technology now. I didn't have that. That would have been a lifesaver. Graph paper instead of line paper. You see what happens. Request for copies of notes. I lose everything. I don't know what is or isn't important. In my mind, everything's important. Well, if you go through that mentality, you think you have to memorize everything. Good luck sleeping. You're going to battle insomnia. And I've done that as well. Because in our mind, everything holds value. 
How are you supposed to know if you have no middle ground what is or isn't valuable? You need to teach us how to self-prioritize. These emotions and these ways of functioning in the world don't come natural to us. We look upon you as parents, as teachers, as aides. I look upon my wife as the same situation. I need that guidance tool. And even furthermore, in a classroom, if you put me in a regular classroom, I can learn from those who are higher functioning. I need that input. But I need that aid to guide me because of my poor judgments. If a child is trying to take advantage of me, I wouldn't know. Here's a toy. Okay. End of the school year. I didn't get my toy back. He's not giving it back to you. But why? I gave it to him. He's my friend. You need to guide me how to interact with some of these and also how to say no and know your boundaries. These are very important situations. Accommodations in school. Extra time to complete assignments. Because of the processing and functioning, and it takes roughly 30 seconds to convert short-term into long-term memory, a six-hour day is like 18 hours for me. It's beyond fatiguing. So I need someone there to make sure my assignments are more limited and someone there to guide me step by step, the use of a power professional and some of these sensory breaks. Because if you break my pattern, I am going to melt down at 5 or 32, it doesn't matter. It's what I expect. If you change what I expect, you make a left turn, I expect a right turn, you did wrong. Why would you do that? Because this is what I had memorized. Why would you change it up? Did I do something wrong? Teachers should phrase things in the positive. We know how hard everything is. We're smart. We get how difficult things are. Praise our achievements. Praise even our efforts. Even if our efforts look terrible, just praise that we're giving the effort and the attention because nothing we do is easy. It takes a lot of time, a lot of focus, a lot of attention just to produce even a sentence on a piece of paper. Praise the fact. Don't say, write more. That's not going to help. It's just going to become more painful. Just praise as we go along. And also, please be understanding. I was fortunate, like I said, to be trained by the top experts in the UK. Right now I'm working with Princeton University's neuroscientist department. And they're asking me questions because they have a child who has the condition and he was labeled a sexual deviant at age six because he's so sensory seeking and needing the input. He's approaching other children in that sort of sexual way where he's really a three-year-old not even knowing the ramifications of his behaviors. Person with dyspraxia and DCD have a terrible short-term versus long-term memory. And here's how this one works too, and this is the kicker. Even our positives become our negatives too. If I failed an exam in your class three weeks ago, all I could think is I'm going to fail every exam in your class. Because my long-term memories tell me I failed that exam. So every time I go into your room, my test anxiety is through the roof. Because all I can remember is getting a bad grade. And I can't understand how I could fluctuate and learn and get a good grade. It's stuck there. Hands-on learning serves us well. If you could show us, you could teach us, we could see it, we could memorize, we could process it. Show us. Don't leave anything to be oblivious. My wife is currently packing the house as we speak because she didn't want me involved, trust me. And she wanted me to get some wall hanger stuff. So I got her eyeglass uh, equipment and she goes, what is that? I go, is that for the, the wall? She goes, no. You have to show me a photo of what I need to get at CVS, exactly what I need to get at CVS. So you're going to be coming home with some weird objects. If you show it to me, I can see it. I can even show the person at CVS what I need to get. Otherwise, it's oblivious and left to my own devices. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Welcome to the rest of your lives. Everything has to be repeated and everything has to be structured. Unfortunately in life, that's very difficult because things are always changing and evolving. But that's how things get into our memory. And certain things well, you'll try over and over again and finally it's clicked. At the age of 19, I finally learned how to use a can opener. I started, I took home ec when I was like 12, 13. I took all these therapies to try to help me. Finally, I was able to do it. Now I eat tuna every day because I can. Because I'm so proud that I can open it. It's a sense of accomplishment. I could feed myself. I could do this on my own. I've learned how to. Therapies you might consider, which is the vision therapy, which is the ocular, which is, helps you have a sense of space, but also a sense of safety. I don't know if the school bus is two feet or 200 feet away. It's probably a good idea to have some therapy to give you that sort of guidance. Oh, now I'm stepping in front of the swing. Ooh, is that close? Oh, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it's close. <laughs> the cognitive therapy. You teach us through playing these role-playing situations. You talk out with me how I should respond. What is the appropriate way to respond? Because if I left to my own devices, it might come out very, very negatively. And then you have OT and PT. And something like the equine therapy right there, you think balance, stability. Okay, that's great. Kids learn how to drive a car by doing equine therapy. This will show you how to control something else that's not you. 
and learn the spaces to navigate, how to multitask your dimensions. So as you get a car, if you wanted to learn how to drive, in some locations you have to, I'm lucky to be in Chicago where it's not a necessity, you can learn that way. And obviously speech therapy, the globally impacted child. Benefits of dyspraxia, being tenacious. Well, that's a good thing, but we could be tenacious for the wrong thing because of wrong judgments. We could be into something that could be inappropriate because the judgments are not telling us the right things. Being creative, being empathetic. And th this is what, what kills me. With the condition, we're highly empathetic, but people will take advantage of that because I'm too empathetic. Well, I don't understand why people will take advantage because I don't get deception. So people could be tricking me using my empathy for their own personal means, and I wouldn't understand the situation until later on. The sense of humor. Because of this uh, long-term memory thing, and the ability to bring out some of this huge vocabulary, we say things that are not only as humorous, but very adult humorous. You, you, she probably learned from you, your husband. <laughs> Good with animals. Because an animal does not talk back to you, it does not judge, you can process, it can function at a lower level, you learn to care as the next thing that comes together. You could be creative, you see the big picture. Anything that's in the middle holds no value to me. I know how to get to the end. I have it planned, but the little steps in between are the hardest things for me. The easiest things for you are the hardest for me. So we live in a completely different parallel world. We are very innovative, very cu and curious, and very enthusiastic. And these are some of the kids who have the condition. Sweetest boy, he's Ethan, he's global dyspraxia, tenacious. As you can see, he has an aide helping him. He's not, he's not on that surfboard on his own, trust me. Someone's guiding him and helping him. But he's going to be like, wow, I did it. All I needed was someone to help me. That's all I wanted. And once I achieved it, I'm on top of the world. Common mo comorbidities, ADHD, SPD, autism, dyslexia. The comorbidities that come with this condition are so ranged, it's absolutely massive. I've had to learn a thousand different comorbidities running this foundation. Anything that has to connect left and right, most people have two eyes, two ears, this can be very problematic medical conditions as well. You have a lot of genetic mutation disorder, you have a lot of things that are tied to the dyspraxia. Just like I said, okay, you can go. Un ah, depression, anxiety, and stress, oh my. Decreased verbal IQ, poor social communication, being bullied and low, lower global self-esteem and scholastic competence all significantly increase the risk of mental health difficulties in children with DCD or dyspraxia. We are such perfectionists that we expect things to come out a certain way. We are our hardest critics. We take it all out on not you guys, we take it out on us. We get anxious, we get depressed with how we're achieving. It's twofold increased uh, odds of child reportedly symptoms of depression for children with uh, DCD and dyspraxia. Depression is very common because you go through life, people not seeing, understanding, or believing. It's like I, take the, like, like I said, take the bus. Like, do I have to lecture to the driver every time I get on the bus in Chicago? Or should I just take a taxi and he goes, which way do you want to go? I don't know. <laughs> just take me home. Well, if I go this way or that way. And then he goes, uh, we'll go this way. Okay. And now he's taking advantage of me and trying to get more money. Great, thank you, Matt. Children with probable DCD have increased odds of hyperactivity, inattention, emotional problems, peer relationship difficulties, and fewer pro social skills compared with their peers. Understand, support, and accept. One of the biggest missions of the foundation is to educate parents, persons living with the disorder, and even top professionals. I am amazed at how many neurologists and neuropsychs email me on a daily basis from the top universities to the top hospitals. They want to know, which is a good thing. They want to learn. I'm the ultimate guinea pig. I live with this condition. Do whatever you want with me. I'm here to help so the, your kids have the best chances possible. Thank you guys for letting me speak. Tomorrow we have a meet and greet. I'm happy to meet your children, be self-esteem, build role models, build friendships. It's absolutely important with this condition. Thank you guys.